Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. Hey, uh, Zipper on Disney here from Columbus, Ohio. And I'm your co-host, Ian Wood. <laughs> we want to, uh, this podcast was created to provide you, our heroes, with new and reusable material for both players and DMs. Yeah, we hope to inspire you with some creative content so you, uh, so you can help bring your next adventure. Our show may not be suitable for young children, but neither is our D&D games. So <laughs> on to our main topic today, make your combat flow with YouTuber Zipperon Disney. Once again, yeah. man, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really yeah. appreciate it. Um, for the people that don't know, know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and and, and how you kind of got into this this thing. Ooh. Uh, so I started making D&D videos on YouTube because I ran out of videos that I wanted to watch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's... you know, you not have to throw shade on, like, any individual creator, but there's a whole lot of content out there about, you know, beginner DM tips, common five mistakes, you know, here are the most powerful spells. And that really wasn't uh, what I wanted. And once I realized that I couldn't find the content I wanted, I had the realization that I had to make it myself. <laughs> right. And even yeah. then, some of the content that is out there, like I've seen like a few times, we're like, we're going to break down this topic, and here's how you build this character. And if you want to uh, make this even more, more, more powerful, bring in this unethical camera. Like, I don't want the unethical camera. I want the real printed stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just this one content, example, right. mind you. So. <laughs> what I think is cool is that reminds me, I'm a, I am read a lot of books. I'm a big reader. That's where mm -hmm. I steal most of my D&D &D concepts and everything from. It's true. And Christopher Paolini, who wrote the Aragon series, actually did the exact same thing. He ran out of books at his library. And it's like, well, if I want a story, I'm going to write my own. And that's how we got the Aragon series, and which is awesome. Nice. So you're right up there with Christopher Paolini. And oh, I, man, that was one of my favorite audiobooks as a kid. I remember listening to that all the time driving around in the car. And, oh. and I know he his, some of his books takes like uh, some flack from like uh, some people in the community. But I was like, guys, he posts for book when he's 17. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah. I, I thought it was good stuff. I didn't haven't wrote a novel at, yet, and I'm <laughs> going to be 35. Oh, my God, I'm getting old. Oh, man, the years start coming, and they don't stop coming. I know, Back to right? the rules, they hit the ground running. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's very cool. Uh, once again, Ian, if you want to post the, the link to his channel. And, I already did. Oh, dude, look at that. I, don't, I love yeah. it when he – this is le he leveled up just now because I didn't have to tell him to do it. He just did it. I'm always a fan. So um, now that we know who you are, one of the we really like to get on more of a personal level. So would you be willing to tell mm -hmm. us about your most memorable D and D moment? Oh man! So I think probably the highlight of my D and D career was when I TPK'd an 18th level party. <laughs> That's yeah. savage. How did was that like uh, like um, a happy accident or? Kind it was of... the accumulation of like a year and a half long campaign, right? Like right. probably like a hundred plus sessions. Oh, uh, yeah, and it came down to the very, very end of the wire, right? Like they had, uh, it's a huge story. I'm probably gonna have to tell it one time. I have to make a whole video about it. But the whole party came together to try to defeat, you know, the the big bad evil that was gonna destroy the entire world, mm -hmm. and they failed. And they failed not because of the baddie was really strong, not because it had a, a high armor class or a high attack bonus, but they failed because of their character arcs. The way that we had set up the story was each of them had competing goals. And their inability to work through their uh, character, and I guess to a lesser extent their player uh, motivations, was what really led to their downfall. Oh, wow. And so now, like, uh, there's no wood elves in my setting because they're all like, <laughs> oh, they turned to permanent salt. Lost a whole race of people? Wow. Yeah. That's savage. Well, and, yeah. And, and awesome. Like, I want to roll a wood elf. Sorry, they killed them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's an example of why there's. It's okay to occasionally not have something in your game that a player wants. Oh, you can be an elf. Just If you want to be a wood, you can be a high elf who lives in the woods, all right? <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's the thing I do, right? Like, uh, all the all the games I play, they're set in, like, the same game world, right? Like, I use my own custom setting for mm -hmm. every game that I run. And it's all played on, like, this one single continent. But I let the players know that there's another continent across the seas. So if they want to play something that's, like, not, like, canon in the setting, they can do that. Oh, they that's just come clever. from this other area that no one knows about. Makes sense. I'm totally yeah. stealing that for a DM tip one of these days because that's fabulous. Don't worry, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, accolades for it because that that's really cool. Because that's something I see a lot of when 
and I don't mean to get too much on a tangent. It's kind of my shtick, unfortunately. <laughs> um, when DMs say, oh, that's not in my world, well, how much of your world has your players explored? <laughs> Is it like that throughout the entirety of time? I know in one of my friend's campaigns, um, they've run a thousand years in the past and future, and because of that, yeah. the settings, it's the same world with the same history, but it's got different rules. It's this in the future. It's got, you know, magic and it's more Ravnica like where it's a massive city. And in the past, it's very much the classic Forgotten Realms. And then somewhere in the middle, it's like Eberron where it's, it's, society's evolved. Everyone's mastered the art of the arcane. And, and so you can really just decide, well, what era do you want to play in? Which he based it off of Chrono Trigger. I don't know if you've ever played that, that old game, which is all about time. No, no, no. But I, I know what you're talking about. I get so, where you're coming from. So very cool. All right, and uh, since you've got quite a bit of experience under your belt, we've all been there at some point, but when would you say you've uh, failed most as either a DM or a player? And what did you learn oh, from man. that? So I think, all right, I think I have a kind of a different answer here, right? All like right. there's mistakes that you make when you're playing the game, like you make a bad call as a DM, or you run a situation in the game that doesn't really come out the way that you want, or you can, a player's unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all like just part of the progress, right? Right. Yeah. But I think my biggest failures are more on the high level, the more social failures, okay. right? Like I was running a game at a convention, and one player was really sort of uh, dogging on another, right? And I didn't say anything to stop them. Oh. And that's that's something that I feel like really ashamed about, like afterwards. Like you know, I knew what the right thing to do was, and I just you know I was not comfortable doing it at the time. And then. Yeah. Reflecting on that, I'm like, no, if you're going to be the, the DM, or if you're essentially going to lead this group, it's up to you to set the example for others to emulate. And I've never let that happen since. That's awesome. Even though it's uncomfortable, it's more uncomfortable for that player, and so you have to stay, step up. And uh, sometimes, let's be real here, some, some of those decisions seem way obvious when you look back on it, because hindsight's 20, 20 mm -hmm. so... Yeah. But you learn from it. That's the important yeah. thing. <laughs> and it doesn't help. Yeah. Now, this, I know this isn't like you know, you, uh, globally um, the norm, or it doesn't, it's not a blanket statement encompassing everybody, but we do know that nerds and gamers aren't exactly the type to engage in, in forceful conversation or awkward situations yeah. voluntarily because we already make the situation awkward. So, Guilty. <laughs> so that's very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. Hopefully, we like doing that because while we come up with a million DM tips and player tips every week, Mm -hmm. we've not done it all. And so being able to get insight from our, our guests who have experienced it really is uh, fantastic. So thank you so, uh, so much for, for uh, sharing that with us now. Yeah, of course. Now why everyone's here uh, now that they, we've spent 15 minutes talking about the boring stuff that nobody may or may not care about. Um, really they're here to experience and how to make your combat flow in before we get started, you have already done a video on this. This is actually why mm -hmm. I um, invited you on because I was so blown away and I wanted you to share that with our audience. Uh, we have a link in our show notes, not only to your channel, but also to your this particular video. Um, and I want to pick your brain on it. So um, a lot of this, if you've seen the video already, will be kind of a refresher for those that seen the video, but mm -hmm. also uh, it'll give me an opportunity to actually interact with you during those points and, and pick your brain and, and, and challenge you on a few things. That being said, yeah. um, you, you open your uh, you open your videos off awesome. By the way, can I just say that? Like, Thank you. <laughs> the fact that you compare uh, action scenes from Michael Bay seeming like a drag on when it's got so much action and explosions and kaput to being really just a drag versus something like the Battle of Helm's Deep. Um, that keeps you on, keeps you on your edge of your seat, and that was such an accurate description because that's exactly how I felt the first time I I, I watched that. So, mm -hmm. um, so what is it? Do you think that's be so that's between the difference between those two fights that really makes one so epic and legendary and hanging on to your hanging on to your seat, and the other one's like, man, we gonna get back to the plot? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think that's the, the key part here. In the Helm's Deep, the, the story is told through the battle, right? Right. That they're, like, if you can break that down, you can take off, I know they cut away to, like, other parts of the, the story, but if you break off Helm's Deep, there's definitely, like, story beats. There's little arcs that happen all the time through it. It links each individual fight together. They're telling their story through the combat. As opposed to, like, Michael Bay, they just do action sequences, you know, which are, are cool enough. But it doesn't really draw you in. It doesn't have the same emotional appeal. Mm -hmm. You know, things are explode and things move around. The camera's shaking, but it's, it's not really telling a story the same way that you see in Helm's Deep. I agree very much. 
So, and obviously that must have something to do with the, the flow, right? That's kind of where we're yeah. going. So uh, what exactly mm -hmm. is the flow and how is it different from the traditional? Because when I first saw the flow of combat, I automatically assumed just speeding up combat. How do you make yeah. it faster to get to the point? But with your narrative comparing Michael Bay to, to Helm's Deep, mm -hmm. I realized that it's not necessarily about the speed. And so can you yeah. tell us about what you mean by, you know, the, the what is the flow? Yeah, so real fast, that's the, the little plug for my channel. Like he's, I focus on advanced dungeon master techniques, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. And I think a big feature of my channel is irony. <laughs> that there is the, the common advice that you hear all the time. And I think, okay, most of this is wrong. And so here's something in contrast to that or something that's unexpected compared to that common advice. Right. And so like you said, a lot of people assume that, okay, just getting your combat done fast is what it's about. But that's not really the case. Like you can watch uh, like a, a really good DM like Matt Mercer. He will keep you engrossed for a long period of time because there's all these little beats and uh, there's a narrative sequence and draw that happens in their combat. So that's what I really wanted to, to focus on in, in, in the video is not necessarily the tips and tricks to make your combat run faster, but to make it more coherent and to flow smoother. Because once you, uh, once you get into a rhythm, you sort of build on yourself. You get this natural ebb and flow, rise and fall of action that keeps you engrossed. And uh, like I say in the video, that's sort of like a, a zen state. You're fully immersed in what you're doing. You are present in that combat, which is what we really, really want. That actually reminds me of like uh, years back when one of my old gaming groups, we were playing like a uh, Gamerol campaign off to the side. And for those of you who don't know, Gamerol mm -hmm. basically got a mashup of fantasy and sci-fi and... It's awesome. Basically... Now throw all that into like a post-apocalyptic Mac, Mac style world where everything's going wrong. But I want to wear my tire armor. Thank you very much. <laughs> as long as you don't make that up sounds my, awesome. It is. As long as you don't make up my, my gnome stick. Uh, <laughs> get laser cannons and beat people with like flashlights and rubber armor that's made of an old tire. It's it's or a hubcap if you want to go with like the the chest plate breastplate thing. It's pretty fun. My character's main weapon was a garden gnome duct taped to a stick. <laughs> 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 oh, anyways. Okay. But anyway, our climactic like um, finale, if you will, for, for the entire campaign was we basically started off with like a chase sequence. Like all three of us, our entire party basically had like uh, five vehicles, no, three vehicles that we're using to chase down an a armored mm -hmm. RV, and we basically had to jump our vehicles under that one and basically kill everybody inside and take it over. But then the fight shifted. It was like, oh crap! Now we t we took it over. Now we have to fight this <laughs> these hordes of other beds who have their own vehicles and defend this thing. Chasing it. Right, so like the battle kind of like shifted in a completely different direction at the right. halfway point. It, it was a, it was a blast, but That's a yeah, so you create like a, a connection between like one side of the combat and the next, one little scene and the next, and help this uh, whole sequence flow out instead of just feeling like a, a procedural A, B, C, right. Right? which is unfortunately a very common approach that people take. Now, yeah, for for everyone out there that does that, it doesn't mean you're wrong. But um, obviously, I work in statistical engineering. We're always about continuous improvement. So the, mm -hmm. the goal of this uh, show is not to dog anybody's play style, but to hopefully open your eyes to ways to improve it and just improve your, your game so you it, it's more memorable and it's more fun for everyone involved. Yeah. And, and I'll admit, one thing I, I kind of was proud of, too, is before the fight even started, I'm like, before we start, DM, what is the move speed for the motorcycles on the vehicles? Uh, 40 feet for all intents and purposes. Why? I turn to the player who's at uh, one of his uh, two classes of speedster. What's your move speed? It's four. Can I run on flight? Keep up the vehicles? <laughs> <laughs> I just start like kicking people off. Okay. Like Captain get, America. And just like the, the expression of the GM's like, I can't argue this and I hate every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, answer it. That's why it's kind of funny right now, yeah. then, too. But anyway, I was trying to somehow segue this into the next question. <laughs> what can we as a DM use to improve th this flow of combat <laughs> okay so in the in the video i say i have a whole bunch of advice but i i only give like one sentence on it so oh man what is it you dramatize transitions to create exigency then prompt activity and compress the resolution that's big what, okay so what does that mean <sighs> yeah a lot so the first <laughs> thing is this idea of dramatizing transitions um there is a fantastic article out there by uh, angry dm called like make your combat like a dolphin or something like that I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with Angry DM, he has a really great mind, actually, but his a blog post is, like, almost impossible to read, right? <laughs> He's got his uh, Yosemite Stam shtick that he does all the time, and then it's just, they have to be 5,000 words. Like, that's his standard. 
Yep. But if you distill it down, it's this uh this great idea that what you really should be doing is instead of narrating a player's turn with things like I hit it with my sword and you feel the sparks fly, uh, and you stab it in the stomach and blood spilled out everywhere, like those sorts of things, instead of wasting your time narrating that, what you should narrate is the transition between turns. Okay. The reason being is you only have so much time that you can narrate before your players check out, right? If you as a DM just keep running your mouth nonstop, it makes everything slow down to the point where players get bored. I do that. So you have to be kind of conscientious of what you're narrating. And players already have their imaginations. They're already envisioning in their head what their character is doing when they're making this attack. So I don't think you need to describe that. Rather, your job as a DM is to create drama. So what you do is you find a little bit of drama and you narrate the space between their turns. So after the hit, but before the next player goes, you set the stage. You use your little bit of, you paint a word picture of what's going on in the battlefield and point out some things that are that are really dangerous, some things that are points of high tension. Yep. You engage the enemy much in combat. He approaches you. He then draws back his, his fist and it flies towards you. And then suddenly you, you see yourself sitting at the day table with your family as a child. Then you see yourself training with, with your old master in combat. And suddenly you're brought back to reality. It's, 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 it's like connects to your face. You might like 20 feet. <laughs> Did my life just flash before my eyes? Well, you just took 50 damage, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and, and before we go too far, one of our um, users is asking a question. You beat me to it. Mm -hmm. Right. How much of this flow of ca flow should be geared towards the specific skills or stories of the PCs? And do you always try to include a little something for everyone? <laughs> So I think that's a question of what the PCs are doing like on their turn, right? If they're trying to, to, to use a skill to do something, then yeah, that's definitely a, a part of the narrative. And that's uh, important because you're trying to give, you're trying to fulfill the fantasy for that player. That they said they're trying to use the skill to accomplish this task because they think that will make their character look cool and make them feel cool for doing it. And so yeah, it's very important to, uh, to incorporate that. But again, it all should be for this purpose or... I should say, in addition to the purpose of making that player feel cool, you should also use that as an opportunity to, to set up the next beat, right? It's all about uh, creating this buildup and then paying it off. So you should always be, as soon as you resolve something, you should be drawing up the drama for the next beat. And which is our, the, the next big point here is this idea of creating exigency. So exigency is a really cool word. It should be your favorite word as a DM. I don't exigency know what that is, means. is uh, it's ah. urgency plus opportunity. It's this thing that if you don't take advantage right now, the opportunity to do so vanishes. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it's it's a moment that demands action. I uh, towards the sense of demanding action. One uh, one thing I've been tinkering with, and this kind of it sounds like this come, turned it with the uh, running into next turns. Um, mm -hmm. For me, when it's supposed to be the next person's turn. I always say, um, you see uh, Shirk twist and cut and slash as he, he jumps away, pushing back the enemy. What do you do sort of thing? Is that kind yeah. of what you're talking about with the, the, the create exigency? That's exactly it. So when you end one player's turn and you start to turn the focus to the other. So, okay, you hit the orc and he starts to bleed. All right, uh, Keely. So you start looking around, you draw your bow towards the next orc, and you see your friend dying on the side. And But across there, the, the cave troll is just pounding time after time on Calvin. What are you going to do? So creating the, the sense that if Keely doesn't act right at this very moment, uh, the cave troll is going to kill Calvin, and her other friend's dinosaur is also going to uh, bleed. So you create these situations when you're turning the focus from one player to another that gives some ideas what that character has to do, the immediate stakes on their turn. And that really, what's great is because it puts them in a situation of, okay, I have to do something now because if I don't, something yes. bad's going to happen. And that was the one thing that I really noticed when you got to that part in the story is that's something that I really can improve upon because mm -hmm. I ran, so I ran, so I watched a video a while ago and yesterday or Saturday and Friday, I ran games with the sole purpose of trying to focus on this format. And all I can say is I felt as a DM, the combat was more engaging. I felt that it was more visual in my head. I hope it felt the same way for the players. Um, so I was super excited to talk about this because I, I have applied these since watching your video and I know that they work and I can't, mm -hmm. I can't speak to them, especially the, the, the next point there, which is the, the prompting, the act, the, the activity, oh, because man. I utilize that to even offer suggestions to the new, 
the new player who hadn't played in 20 years. So, you know, uh, well, shit, what was his uh, name? I don't remember. Uh, oh, Comma Storm. I was like, all right, so the the tall barbarian-looking drow is being hammered by Shirk, who looks like this alien venom carnage hybrid with a, and smashing onto him. And you glance with your perception out of the last back of your eye that the tied-up drow just broke free, is barreling down behind um, Alani, who doesn't see him. What do you do? Your buddy's mm-hmm. being attacked. She's about to be stabbed. By putting him in that situation, I get, I was able to deliver two choices that I made available to the new guy and kind of gave him a, a choice between A and B instead of just saying, okay, it's your turn. What do you do? Yeah. Um, what you want to do is that you want to point out to the player that they are on the horns of a dilemma all the time, right? That they always have to do uh, something or else something terrible is going to happen. Or at least, and that's what... I like that about combat because it creates this feeling of urgency and terror and excitement that your combats really should have. Oh, shit, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I agree. And that's something that, I mean, I guess Ian would know better than me because I'm the DM and he's the player. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping that this will come through when we start our, our live stream soon. But um, that's something I had never considered until I watched your video. And it seems like such a small thing. And something that, I, as a DM, an experienced DM, I should already know that I should be prompting them with choices. But that's always something I've only thought of outside of combat, not in mm-hmm. combat. Basically, I took, I created like li- because of this, I created little mini hooks in the person's turn, and I was just blown away because that uh, I don't know if it intentionally did or unintentionally, it sped up combat because I basically mm-hmm. told them, "Here's your current choices." Now I didn't limit them to that. But once you Mm -hmm. get it into their head, they're instinctively going to pull to those choices versus coming up with something else unless they had already had the forethought. That's the big one. Exactly. Because some people get to their That's exactly it. And they're like... That if they already have an idea, you're not taking their idea away from them. But if they're thinking, okay, what am I going to do? You've already... uh, They're not just frozen in that moment because you've already pointed out some things that require their immediate attention. Yeah, and and that seems like such a subtle thing. But I immediately, like I said, I had a player who hadn't played in 20 years, and he had faster um, response time and turns than any of the, my experienced players, except for maybe the one that ha- thinks out every single thing, like 20 moves in advance, <laughs> Ian. <laughs> so, all right, just remind me, Justin, is this, okay. this, this, and this here? Can I do this, do this, do this? I yes, have... Ian. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair... <laughs> I have to play awesome stuff. Right, it is <laughs> awesome. I'm not. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, but when the player is like that, they already know what they're gonna do. But more often yeah. than not, they the the player's like, all right, what can I do? But by presenting mm-hmm. choices to them in these little tiny combat hook combat hooks, that's what we could call it. Yeah, combat yeah. hooks. Um, you're kind of narrowing their focus no and longer. speeding up the game. So. So that's a nice segue into the, the next point here is that you prompt the activity. So the, a big shift that, a big shift right there to sort of get them to act right away is you go from what do you do to what are you doing. It's a, again it's just a very subtle shift, but it puts the player in that mindset that they don't have time to act because their character is already engaged in what they're doing. It meshes the the fiction better with the, what's actually happening at the table. Absolutely. So, There's a great video by Matt Click. Uh, He's another uh, writer, YouTuber. Uh, I tried to find, okay, aside, I tried to find it one time. And so I tried to like Google, you know, Matt, you know, Click and then put quotation marks D&D. And it just came up with like a transcript of Critical Role of Matt Mercer opening (laughs) doors. Like Matt, (laughs) Click. What the hell? (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, so anyway, it's somewhere on his YouTube channel. But he has this thing about... uh, how to talk to characters when they're out of combat when they're like around the fire, right? Mm-hmm. He says, what are you doing? And sort of they're just to sort of pull them into the moment. And I thought that was a really great idea, but instead of applying it in, you know, these social uh, role play situations, you move it into combat to make players feel like they have to act right now. Right, right. And, and so again, this is a subtle shift, but it really gets the players into the, the mindset that, oh, I have to act in this very moment. Yeah, and, and once again, I applied the, I tried to apply these techniques in the last couple of sessions and it really, cause normally I would say, um, what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. Um, instead of what are you doing? Because what are you doing? They think of things 
outside of the, oh, I want to look around or I want to do this. No, my, I think one of the things was my character's fiddling with a sword. That's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. The, uh, the, uh, what was the Joker guy doing? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm hiding in the bush just watching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, that, I'm pretty sure I used this as an example on the show one time, but we were, I was once playing the game of Mutants and Masterminds, which is a superhero RPG, and the character I built, I did say up front to the players, like, okay, he technically, in my mind, has no superpowers. But he's a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> he's not flying. He's dancing on the leaves in the trees. Right. Like, like, yeah, I think like the old like Hong Kong action style movies that are right. exaggerated. <laughs> That's kind of yeah. how I envision them. But there was one point where we got into like a, our plane got attacked by fighter jets. And I'm like, well, I'm just this uh, athletic ninja. What am I going to do? Right. But, athletic ninja. <laughs> yeah, you can <laughs> jump from one fighter jet to the other. <laughs> Funny that you, that you say that because one of our players yes. tried to do that. And he was like, and he was like our not Wolverine character, if you will, but the other <laughs> failed and fell into the ocean. <laughs> uh, but I was like, wait, we can do that? Yeah, you can do that. Hmm. So I basically jumped from our plane, landed on another plane that's attacking us, right at the cockpit. I'm like, okay, I rolled my attack. I rolled really high. And then the game's like, so, so I take you punch a pilot. No, I mean for the ejection seat button. <laughs> that's funny the expression on his face like what that's very cool i like that and the place just burst out laughing it so worked. as we're, we're 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 coming to the close of the we've prompted the player they they've they, mm -hmm. they've decided what they're gonna do you have this term called compress the resolution can you share with crit nation exactly what you mean by this okay I love so that story. The, the big idea behind this is the moment of highest tension is paired exactly with the moment of highest uncertainty, right? You want to know if your sword's gonna slay it exactly when you roll the dice, right? Because all of the, uh, all of the excitement is tied up in that unknown. And so what you wanna have happen is as soon as the die hits the table, you want to know whether or not you hit. Because as soon as that, that randomness is resolved, that should be the, the big release, right? You don't want a slow burn after your climax. You wanna go, <gasps> and then move on to the next thing. Right. Um, so the idea is this is uh, why I like sharing the armor class ahead of time with the, the players. They know what number they need to roll. So as soon as the die hits the table, it's there. You want to, uh, to, to speed that up. Because if you drag that out, okay, I got a 5 plus 7. Uh, that's 12. And all the excitement of stabbing this person just sort of goes away. So if you can screech that down uh, to, the, to the smallest possible moment, it's going to keep your excitement up. And, and that's what you really want, right? This, uh, you want to keep this flow, this building and release of tension, this rhythm of excitement and relief. And uh, compressing the resolution down to as small a moment as you can is really going to help that out. Yeah. I, I hope that explained that to you. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's a lot better in the video. Than I had time so to it out. this... Oh, I do see. I'll take. I'll, answer, I'll ask that. I haven't asked that in a second. Um, so this is actually the one thing that I I remembered halfway through the second game, that mm -hmm. I finally just told them what the AC was because I remembered that because they would stop after multiple hits. Does it hit? Does it hit? Does it hit? Yeah. But especially at higher levels, I think they were level six. So I don't necessarily consider it a higher level, but yeah. mm -hmm. they if they know what it is, they can just look at their dice and they don't have to stop in between. Which once again kind of brings that that flow <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. a kink. <laughs> so, yeah. If you I... know what the armor class is and you know your attack bonus, you know exactly what number you need to roll so you don't have to stop and do the math, right? Mm -hmm. Like, So usually as soon as, uh, as soon as a monster is hit the first time, I'll just get out my pen and just write it on the battle mat, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone can see exactly what it is. The same thing with, uh, with DCs, yeah, right? That's convenient. So they know whether or not they saved. Yeah, see, now, I, because, I, with uh, DCs, I definitely do that. Like, I will just say, here's your target. Um, do mm -hmm. you succeed? Because, honestly, um, I go around the table and get tired of people asking me. And when it's like, everyone's got to make the AOE save, I got a 16, does that, do I save? I got a 14, does that, you know? And I, yeah, exactly. So exactly. I definitely understand the advantage there. Do you mm -hmm. want to... Uh, I do the same thing sometimes. Like, okay, you need to make a DC 13 strength check in order to escape, or a DC 13 strength saving through, or something like that. Uh -huh. Because... I don't think that unknown of, oh, did I make it, is really worth that whole dragging it out, right? Right, I would agree. That, I, I think it's a bad trade-off. 
Um, so in the chat, uh, Papa Fox Tacos <laughs> says, so, or he says, what are you doing facilitates role play a lot better than what do you want to do? I think it automatically places the player in their character shoes and demands action. And I think all of this kind of, a lot of this stuff that you've set up stems from, stems from all of mm -hmm. the putting the character into the, sh their sh the player mm -hmm. into the character shoes and um, pulling in that action. So I, I, I agree with that. And I think it kind of all hinges on that that subtle difference of what is your character doing versus what are you mm -hmm. doing, you know? So, um, yeah, you want to, you want to play the game in the moment as much as you possibly can. Right. Yeah. That, you know, I think like all of us who take this hobby, you know, pretty seriously, we spend a lot of time thinking about the, the theory of how we should play. We spend a lot of time like reading stuff and engaging in content like this, but oh, when you're actually at the table, that's the only game that matters, right? There is no D and D for the angels. There's no, you know, plutonic ideal of Dungeons and Dragons. There's only the, the fun and the flow that you have right there at that very moment. And so that's what you should really focus on is making that experience as perfect as possible. I would agree. Um, like I said, uh, I absolutely loved this video and I loved it so much. I was like, I got to get it zipper on on. <laughs> um, because the, it's one of those things that as experienced DMs, we should know. But mm -hmm. it doesn't get, some people know it instinctually. If you don't pick it up, you just followed what the, 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 the quote unquote rules say. And it doesn't cover, in my opinion, these little nuances that your video does. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you really did a, a, a wonderful job. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on in regards to the flow of combat um, at this point? Um, Cause there's one thing I would like to, to, uh, to kind of discuss and hear your thoughts on, but uh, before that, I want to know if there's anything you think we should additionally we should cover. Maybe something that came out after you had made the video that you learned about. Yeah. So I, I will say that again with everything, like you have to be judicious in your use, right? You can't just assume that if I follow exactly these rules, everything's going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And I've recorded some sessions and I put them up so you can see for yourself that it's not like this amazing thing. Suddenly, my D and D game is worthy of you know, broadcast television. <laughs> uh, and sometimes I do things that are contrary to my own advice, right? Because I feel like, okay, it's not exactly working. If I narrate every single transition, people are going to get bored and things are going to drag down. Mm -hmm. So again, you just always have to be, uh, be really conscientious of what your players are wanting in that moment. Like, like people's faces are way more important than uh, any video or any advice you're going to get online. Right, right. Uh, so there's something that I do in my games that I mm -hmm. really, really love. And I think it, it touches on this whole mantra um oh man and i'm excited to share it with you because i don't I'm know that to hear there's it. a lot of people that do this and maybe there is and they just decide it sucks and they don't want to do it um at the start of all my sessions i have all the players roll initiative so when that moment comes up a balrog bursts through the door scattering um kobolds in villagers in all directions i cast banish. ian what do you do i cast banish there it is. That to me, <laughs> I fucking As... hate Banish. Oh, I said the F bird again. Damn it. I was trying hard not this year to do that. Anyways. Um, so in that, it was a perfect transition of, Ian, what are you doing? As opposed to everyone roll initiative. Because he might have just said, I ask it how it's doing. Or if I, that's more like something Brandon would do. I try to, yeah, I ask him how he's doing or something. And it's funny I, you mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> so what I found is that asking for initiative at the start of the game and at the end of combat not only gives me a tool to interact with the players in an order during like social encounters, but also mm -hmm. when somebody decides to take an action before initiative's rolled, I always give that person the the priority because they took action. And it might be, Ian turns and says, I want to ask uh, um, two, two uh, bandits walk up on you and threaten you with a knife. If you say roll initiative, they might automatically assume it's an automatic combat encounter. But by yeah. not doing that, Ian, what do you do? Well, oh, Ian, what do you do as these big burly bandits draw their swords and walk up to you? I hit him with the hammer. Okay, so he's a bad <laughs> example because he's a combat nut, but it could just be as easy as so, uh, a bard trying to make a persuasion check. Say, hey, uh, mm -hmm. I persuade him that I am the, the noble knight, blah, 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 or I'm that we're poor and we have nothing. And I. Oh, that's kind of funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's why. You just yourself just said, I'm a huge combat nut. And I know my players. And to the 
complete and utter shock of the GM that I play with on Saturdays. He's like, okay, you love combat. You have not made it very obvious you like combat. <laughs> and yet, for the past couple dungeons in a row, you somehow lampshade the entire final encounter with diplomacy. You of all people. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but anyways, oh, go ahead. Well, one was, we were about to fight a white dragon, a very powerful one, too, and we could probably have taken him. I'm like, I'm like, wait, I'm a craftsman who, who can create items of fine quality. What kind of items? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you said you were a crustman. I'm like, oh, crap. That sounds nasty. Yeah. 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 I'm Does a blacksmith. Not be? Yeah. I'm a, I'm a blacksmith who was a forged domain cleric. the armor. If it's metal, I can make it. Can you make a statue? Yes. Can you make them of me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you made a statue of the dragon? Out of my own gold. Oh, that's fantastic. All 20,000 of it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so <laughs> we have, like... because of that, I asked for uh, initiative at the beginning of combat and at the end of combat. And I not only use it as a guide, but it allows me to do a natural flow into combat mm -hmm. when it goes to that. But doesn't automatically signal that they're in a combat counter. What do you think about that, Zipperon? I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic idea. So, ooh, so I, I like it a lot. I'm not sure if I would ever use it in my game for a couple of different reasons. One, because I like the uh, the ritual of rolling initiative. Like I so like good. that everyone gets excited, and because it gives me time. Like you know, I play with like a full uh, train in minis. Ah, so that gives me time to do that. Set it all up. Yeah, yeah. And but if I, I'll say if I were to go that route, I might go like the the far other extreme and just not roll initiative at all. Right. Oh, really? And so whoever is like says, okay, I'm gonna actually get my hammer and swing it, and that's what they do, and then we just keep going around the table that way. I can. So I'm not. I see that. I'm that's not what opposed I do at all kids. in theory. Yeah, it's it, like I said, I like it's it. a lot of fun. Um, it's something that I've really come along to because, not, I mean, yes, does it the role initiative bring it? The role initiative reminds me of uh, you ever play Final Fantasy games? Final Fantasy. Yeah, where they like, <laughs> you know, and breaks apart and it. it it, it says you are in combat, and so... It's very clearly, you go from one thing to this new yeah. thing. It's and I don't... Clearly delineated. I never liked that they were treated differently. Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. actually one of the products mm -hmm. I wrote was uh, uh, skill, uh, skill Challenge, <coughs> challenge Accepted, which is skill challenges that I wrote for 5e, because to me, there should be no difference between combat and social encounters. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. The only mm -hmm. difference is what the player decides to do. But as soon as you say roll initiative, you're basically saying... All diplomacy is off the table. All creative resolutions is off the table. So, um, I think that'll do it for our main topic today. Awesome! I really enjoyed that. That's really exciting. There, I've posted a link to your uh, your Make Your Combat Flow YouTube uh, video uh, and on Facebook. YouTube and on twi Twitch, so hopefully everyone. Yeah, will check, check out that the out. the part two of that one too. How to run an engaging session. I think that also has some uh, some really fantastic. I advice. didn't know you had a part two. See, this is when I miss things <laughs> when I'm busy. Uh, I will definitely check that out. Um, yeah. That being said, before we move on to our next segment, we love to give away fat loots. We like to make it rain on you guys. So we are giving away another prize: Jeff Stevens' Encounter on the Savage Seas Two. Revolutionize your game with this collection of 16 mini adventures and NPCs and locations, all nautical themed, <laughs> which is awesome. If you don't know, Jeff Stevens does a lot of amazing content for DMs Guild. You guys check him out. Um, I'm going to go play Salt Marsh as soon as I'm done here. Yes! Shit's awesome! He, this, this fits really good in with that, 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 whole, uh, that whole archetype or that whole um, theme thing. Now, who is our winner today of this lucky prize there, Zipperon? Our winner is VJ De Guzman. That was, that was pretty much Congratulations, VJ De Guzman. Uh, if you enjoy the product, please leave a review. If you didn't win, no problem. Crit Academy's got you covered. Head on over to CritAcademy.com slash Jeff Stevens and get Encounter on the Savage Seas 3 for free. That's it. That's all it's you got to do. Good deal. Fat loose. Can't argue with free. And nope. it's good stuff. Best sellers. <laughs> that being said, um, congratulations. Our fourth and final segments, the meat and potatoes, or actually the special sauce of the episode. Um, the seasoning. The seasoning. Um, we are moving into our Unearth Tips and Tricks. Uh, if you do not know, in our Unearth Tips and Tricks, we bring you new and reusable content for you to bring with you on your next adventure. 
Our character concept today comes from Zipperon Disney. Can you tell us about your character concept today? My character concept is a hustler, a charlatan, who has limited uh, the divine powers, right? They have limited divination magic, but they pretend to be blind because they figured that people pay more money for a blind seer. <laughs> that is savage. Oh yeah. my God, I love it. Um, yes, yeah, so you pick like a fighter or an Eldritch Knight or something. So you pick a fighter and you get the, the blind fighter feet from the new Unearthed Arcana. Uh -huh. And then you level up in Divination Wizard and you walk around with a blindfold and a cane. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. I really, I like this because um, first, nobody's going to expect suspect that the priest is jipping them. Well, <laughs> I guess that depends on the person. Most people would assume every yeah. temple is jipping them. <laughs> but the fact that you just walk around with a cane and, and all blind and everything, uh yes help me i'll give you free readings um <laughs> and throw a little bit into my what, what what kind of tool would he have to capture all that stuff his this little oh. hustler so i'm imagining that it has like a little like alms bowl right <laughs> and what he does is he tosses like the, the alms bowl up and like reads the bones on the ground he just oh. only looks at them for a second and it gives the answer that's so cool see as a player yeah, i would... they think his eyes don't work right, right? <laughs> so he's like, done actually them. i told him that went over my head he looks down but can't see him. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, this is awesome. And there's good tools in the game that kind of already, you can reflavor like the gambler set that most of the those things get. Yeah. I, I don't know, is that included in the charlatan background, do you know? I think it sounds like it would be. Yeah. Um, so that definitely is pretty cool. The idea that I think would be hilarious is like when he goes to a bar, he just takes it off and several <laughs> of the NPCs that donated to him see him. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, I thought you were blind. Well, I never said that. It I'm was a miracle. A, yeah, it's a miracle. <laughs> I'm not at fault for your assumptions. Because of your <laughs> donations, I have been healed. <laughs> I'll take another bite. Oh, my gosh. I love this. Um, this reminds me of, we did a, uh, we did a character concept with the, the con man, um, the, not the, the, uh, the genie race, the, the genasi who promises oh, to yeah. make wishes come true for favors. Yes. <laughs> and they just use simple things like prestidigitation and thermaturgy to make some spooky stuff happen as if your wish is granted very much like a, a Calypso from the old Twisted Metal games. Yeah, He just promises yeah. it'll happen, but nothing ever comes true, and he's gone. I love it, man. That is awesome. The Hustler Charlatan Blind... What is this? The Blind Charlatan? The Blind, the blind Seer. The Blind Seer. There we go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's awesome. And the fact that you fit it in the mechanics of their the divination makes it even 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 better. Oh man, <laughs> I'm reminded of the blind guy uh, in uh, uh, the Daredevil movie, where the person's about to walk into the, the the road and he uses his cane to stop him. Very much yeah. something like that. Like, wait, what? <laughs> That's a very cool idea. Do you have anything on that, uh, Ian? Sounds hilarious, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> no. I like this, be uh, one last thing, I like this because um, the fact that you're pretending to be blind, if you kept this away from the other characters in the party, <gasps> oh my god, that would be so much role play. Um, excuse me, can I get some food? Uh, will s <laughs> somebody help me? Anybody? I can't. And have ev use, use it as a way for everyone to serve him <laughs> or her. Yeah. Oh. And eventually that's going to come up. Right? Eventually that's going to be a reveal, and there's going to be some. Uh, some oh yeah, they're going to be pissed. You've been lying to them the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, what a great character concept! Thank you so much for the, the, um, the blind uh, seer. Yeah. Oh, I put that actual name in there so I remember to. Yeah, man. <laughs> our uh, that'll do it for our character concept. Our monster variant is the. Earth Rage Battle Briar. Now, for those that don't know, in our monster variant, we take an existing monster in the monster manual, and you're basically going to use that stat block, and you're going to make a few changes. I do my best to keep it within the same CR. Um, it's never exactly precise, but either is CR. So, <laughs> that being said, the Earth Rage Battle Briar are deadly living plants similar to the likeness of like the shambling mound but are purpose purposefully grown to serve the military in military capacities they can destroy mass formations of lesser troops storm defendant embankments and bring down fortifications this battle uh battle briar 
likes to bury itself and use its tremor sense to detect foes passing overhead and erupt from the ground, suddenly catching them in surprise. So, the origin for this is going to be the Zorn stat block. You're going to drop the features of Treasure Sense and the Claw Attack. And you're going to replace it with the new features. Instead of Claw Attack, you're going to have Vine Whip, because I play too much Pokemon, apparently. And what kind of shambling creature made out of plants isn't going to have a Vine Whip? Um, so, basically, this is a 15-foot ranged attack. Um, the stat blocks are in the show notes. The stat block full details is in the, sh uh, the show notes. But what happens is on a, a success of the attack, the creature needs to make a saving throw or be pulled 10 feet towards the battle briar. Um, and since he can do multiple attacks, it really makes this dangerous for bringing all the uh, enemies uh, within range, but letting him stay out of range of everyone else. Now... It gets worse than that. He also gets a feature called spores. Twice a day, he can do a 15-foot radius cloud of toxic spores that extends out from the battle briar. The spores spread around quarters, and each creature uh, in the area that isn't a plant must succeed a DC 17 con save or be poisoned for 24 hours. Now, combine that with the grapple, the, the, the vine whip pulling in with two attacks, follow it up with this. Oh, you guys are done. I mean, you guys are going to have a blast. <laughs> and then, of course, the last feature is the Rising Burst. It bursts out from underneath its victims, sprays rocks and dirt into the air, and causes the ground around it to shake violently. And each creature makes a, 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 a strength saving throw. Uh, or, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Each creature standing within 20 foot of the area must make a strength saving throw. A creature that fails takes bludging damage and is knocked down. Now, once again... This ties in really well with the spores because if you knock them down, they can't run away and poof, poison in all directions. Zipperon, what do you think about this? I think that's a that's a pretty powerful combo. I like it. I like that one-two punch right there. Yeah, I, I really um, I really like I think this um I this technique was based off of something uh I don't know if it was the the um the stupid uh damn, what is that thing called? The Bullet, I think, has something similar. Where it comes out yeah. of the ground, so. Well, the I like the so. story behind this monster a lot too. I think it's really cool. Yes. How you, uh, I, I like where it, it's, it's placed in the world, and I really like the the reflavoring of the the Zorn's features. I think it's a really, I think he's a great job here. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a big fan on reflavoring because Watsy spends thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to balance <laughs> shit, and I don't, so it just makes sense. <laughs> Yeah. It's just easier. I think it's one of the recommendations in the, the Monster Manual to begin with. It's just easier to do it this way. Um, I really like this. This is very much a Bulbasaur-style build to me. Uh, gotta catch them all. Uh, and the other thing I like about this is you mentioned the one-two punch. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Rising Burst does recharge, but only on a six, so they would have to burrow again and then try to do it again. I like that this thing can run away and then stalk the players underground. If it's, got, oh. if it's got a, a mission, uh, it's got a command, stalk, and obviously it's gonna, not going to want to die. Um, it can stalk them and attack them when they're resting. Yeah, you little short rest bitches after every encounter. Ha, 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 not in my game. <laughs> what do you think, Ian? You just want to screw me a warlock, don't you? I do. <laughs> I, don't, I don't screw you that much when it comes to your short rest. <laughs> Okay, maybe a little more, and I probably should. You just don't want me to catch management. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just keep being grief. Yeah. I deserve it. That's just, yeah, you do. <laughs> um, anyway, so overall, this is a fun monster. Thank you for, I'm glad you liked uh, the, the reflavor and stuff. Is there anything you think you would change or add about this to give it a little extra oomph, or uh, do you think mm. it might? it's a good balance of powers as is? So I like the... Uh... I like that it has a, a lot of variety here, right? I, hmm, I think something that, hmm, what I might do is just call it a, no, you can't call it Thorn Whip, because that's, that's already else. a Druid cantrip. So what I'm trying to think of is ways to make it, like, more apparent through its moveset that it was, like, bred for a military purpose, right? I mean, it's obviously a, a badass thing. I'm trying to think of some ways to uh, sort of get that across. Um, uh I mean, a, mm, you're talking strike. like a, a mechanical like way that it comes across, or like in a lore flavor. I think maybe just a, a, a lore flavor way, like because you could totally give like a a a, 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 a nature check or a history yeah. check. These things been used to knock down buildings. Oh, that 
If it broke in when they were inside of a building and the building I'm crumbling around them. <gasps> That's yeah. genius. I like that. Uh -oh. Yeah, I don't know how you could better do that. Unless it had yeah. like harnesses, like something that's put on it to keep it like a like a collar or something to that they can lock it up. That could that could be it. Maybe they got So what I uh so what I normally do, like when I actually say like the the names of the attacks when I'm DMing, right? Like, okay, this person's going to use their rising burst on you. And <laughs> so I awesome. think for my yeah. Like they're so I'm trying to think of something like in there that I would say, but like yeah, as is it's fantastic. I really this is great. I'm happy that you shared this. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like it. Uh, I'm, I love creating monsters um, because mm -hmm. I apparently love challenging my players. Of course, I'm going to have to banish banishment from my game if this douche bypasses every encounter. I'm just kidding. I would never do such a thing. Oh, here. I, I got it. I came up with it. What's you it? give it the, uh, the, the siege monster trait where it deals double damage to structures. Oh, I'm adding that. Yeah. Oh, please. I prove I can bypass the with a clipboard. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, because, you know, who doesn't like their fire-forged uh, monsters being hit with a surprise inspection? Who the hell even does that? <laughs> uh, all right, uh, what is the name of that ability? Siege what? Siege Monster, I think. Siege Monster, I think there's, there's something. I don't know the name off the top of my head. Something like that, though. I'll look, I'll look it up and add it later. All right, yeah. well, that, I like that because we just enhanced this monster with something that I, it makes sense for the creature if it's designed for that. So, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I now am envisioning it having, like, um, where it burrows and stuff, like reinforced iron claws and stuff like this to mm -hmm. really maybe shoulder big giant steel armor for when it's bashing into stuff. That's what I was imagining. Yeah, exactly. I like that. Um, Siege monster, yep. Siege monster? Siege okay. monster. All right, uh, I think that'll do it for our monster variant, the Earth Rage Battle Briar. Uh, Ian, would you like to tell us about our encounter of the podcast? Today, our encounter of the podcast is Conflict Interrupted. The characters stumble into a battle between an adventuring party and the Revenant, who managed to claw its way back into the world to seek revenge against the one who wronged it. It wields a storm strike weapon, which is basically a flame tongue, but with lightning. More lightning! Real. Unlimited power! Real lightning. Both the Revenant and the Adventuring Party request the aid of the players. What do you think about this, Zipperon? I like it. I think it has a lot of potential. So what I like about this particular one, right, is that it, it sets up a scenario, right, but it leaves lots of room for you as a DM to customize it for your particular need, right? Mm -hmm. Like why the Reverend and the Adventuring Party are fighting is one thing that it could be uh, customized for your particular scenario or whatever plot hook you need. And what the the different aids that they're requesting is also can be customized to your particular campaign or particular adventure. Because I like this because that it is specific enough that it gives you an idea for an encounter, but broad enough that has or loose enough that has lots of ways for you to hook it for your specific uh, for your specific table and group. And ho hopefully that comes across in a lot of our <coughs> encounters mm -hmm. because that's really the goal of our encounter ideas and concepts is to really broaden that. So uh, when I wrote this, some of the things that immediately jumped out at me that we could really do with this, you've touched on it, is you don't know why they're fighting, first of all. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Revenant has a magical item says a lot because oh, yeah. what if the play characters decide to help the adventurers, but the adventurers say, well, no, we were fighting it first, that's ours. And so now you create inner party intra party conflict i guess um or maybe they assist the revenant to fight off these adventurers and the revenant isn't a bad guy maybe or it is a bad guy and the adventurers are just trying to steal its weapon maybe it's a villain but actively isn't a villain they just stumbled across an undead with a magical weapon or we gotta slay this bastard you know um those are kind of the things that jumped out at me i love a situation where both sides of the situation is unclear and the players are stuck in a situation of who do I help? Because most adventures, mm -hmm. oh, I got to help the adventuring party. That's usually the pretty simple. The the undead thing's unnatural and probably should be killed anyway. Every paladin's be like, smite that bitch! You know? And the fact well, it's that... It's got it, a story behind it. Like, it's not just there for no reason, right? Yeah. It's not, like, created by an, an evil necromancer. It's got a mission and a purpose. Yeah. And you can leverage that in the... Oh, I need you to help me. They gank, they tried to gank me while I was walking through the forest, minding my own business. And that's mm -hmm. something adventurers would do. 
Uh, I like the idea of putting the adventurers in the wrong. What if they see him and we're going to leave him alone until they saw his magic weapon? And they're like, oh, well, this isn't going to be good. Snap. So now they're just being greedy assholes, which is pretty much every adventuring party ever. So Maybe the, the Revenant has like a real reason someone wronged him. Maybe someone really did him dirty and he gets the adventurers gain sympathy for the Revenant. But then the Revenant later reveals the person who harmed him is the adventurer's friend. Oh, shit, <laughs> dude. I, I love it. Turns out, oh man, a relative, a friend, a past adventurer mm -hmm. that was part of the party. Oh man, oh. dude. My or, dice are tickled right now. Or it's the bartender who's a amateur adventurer and the party likes because he gives him beer. Ooh, <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Um, I think that'll do it for our encounter concept, the conflict interrupted. Zipron, would you like to tell us about our magical item today? Ooh, the magical item is the face stealing ring, which is an uncommon ring that acquires attunement. The flavor text is the wearer of this ivory ring sees the faces of others as potential disguises. So while wearing this ring, you can use an action to speak its command word. And when you do so, you cast the sky self, taking the form of a humanoid creature that you can see. The ring imbues you with that creature's mannerisms, voice, speech, patterns for one hour until you end it as a bonus action. This effect will grant you advantage on charisma persuasion checks to pass yourself off as the creature you're imitating. What so you, you put on this ring, you can see someone, and you can become them. Yes. At least for a little while. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty cool. I think it's uh, it takes a... Uh, a spell from the DMG and sort of twist it in a unique way, right? I think it's the, yep. exactly the sort of thing that a magic item should do in that respect, right? Right. That I like the the story of it. It seems kind of cool that you sort of point your ring at somebody and <laughs> it sort of like soups all over you. Like I can see the, <laughs> I can really clearly imagine that in my mind. Like the Flash's ring when his suit comes out. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Oh my God, you like suck in their image and it stays there and then he points it out and it pops in and he jumps into it. <laughs> Yeah. Mine. <laughs> oh my god! I love that. What do you think, Ian? Considering I'm currently playing and have played some Christmas based characters, you can have a lot of fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I like about this is there's a lot of features and stuff that exist in like magical powers and stuff in the game that mm -hmm. players don't take. But by giving them an item to play with, they're more likely to try to leverage it in a situation. And in my opinion, promoting an RP aspect of the game as opposed to just a, a stab and gank sort of murder obo ish And I'm really a fan of magic items that, that uh, pursue the role play aspect in a way that mm -hmm. they are going to, oh, I got this. I got to use it. All right. And they're, they're now actively looking for a reason to use this thing, even if it's as simple as to pretend to be the stupid bartender so he can walk behind and free up and fill up his booze for free. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that I really like about it. It has that little, that little extra twist. You don't just look like them. It helps you act like them and have their speech patterns. So you really, uh, it's not just stealing their face. It's like a mirror stealing just a little bit of their soul and being. Oh, man. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you snap it, a little photograph comes out. Because <laughs> then they used to think Polaroid. Polaroid steal their souls. <laughs> Oh, man, I really like this magic item. It's simple to the point, and once again, it's something you can add to your game that's not really going to break it. I, um, mm -hmm. Anybody that's listened to the show before knows I don't generally give out, like, magical swords that do ridiculous damage. I'm more of the, let's say, here's a toy they can play with to enhance their, their role play. So I think one of my favorites was the plummeting pouch. You know, it's basically a parachute. It, you can use it once <laughs> without having to spend a long rest to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> um, never going to help them in combat unless they're running away from something and leap off of a tall building or, or, or a cliff or something. So uh, no, no wizard doesn't have to feel guilty for not taking Featherfall. <laughs> right. Except unlike Featherfall, it only applies to the person using it. <laughs> like, the, like the wizard takes the, the, gets the plummeting pouch. I just, sorry guys, I don't prepare Featherfall anymore. See ya. <laughs> oh my gosh. That shit's funny. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I think that'll do it for our magic item today. Our dungeon master tip is super minions. Um, I'm a super fan of this. Shit. I, I think I learned this from somebody, but I didn't put their name on here. If I stole this from you, please let me know so I can add your name because I'm certain this came from somewhere. 
Why did this I do that? This is in the combat video too. Huh? The combat video. Oh, that's the what Super it was Minions. from you, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. I'm putting your name. I was like, I know I took this from somewhere. I didn't put a name. <laughs> this is also from you. Uh, let me do that. Do you want to tell us about our DM tip, Super Minions? Yeah, so minions were this thing from 4th edition. They're these creatures that essentially have all the same stats as something else, but only one hit point, and if they fail their save, or if they pass their save, they don't take any damage. And the idea is that it's just a lot easier for the DM to run mass amounts of monsters and have a, a boss with lots of little things around it, mm -hmm. a minion. So something that I do is I also have super minions that are creatures that essentially have two hit points, or you have to hit them twice in order to get rid of them. So your first strike, I'll say it bloodies it, I'll put a little marker on it, and the second time that you hit the creature, it dies. Or something I do in the back of my head, I, don't, I haven't found a way to, I haven't really tried to word this nicely in fifth edition language, but I also have like a, a threshold, right? Like say, okay, this is a super minion, but it has a threshold of uh, 20 hit points, right? So if you do more than 20 hit points in this first hit, it will just die out, right? I can appreciate that. Um, yeah. I really like this idea because first of all, I already like minions and I've used minions a bunch, a bunch of times. I never thought to get, call them two hitters, basically, is what it mm -hmm. is. Um, mm -hmm. It's not two hit points. It's two hits and you're done, which means they, they don't just outright die against a single attack like a fireball, but a multi-attack mm -hmm. fighter might be able to take one out. Um, and it really it really is interesting to me because it, I immediately thought of a way as utilizing these as a way to scale with the players so they feel like they're growing in power. So the first thing that comes to my mind is Dark Souls. The bosses that you start early on, the strong mini bosses and everything, become just random minions as you go through it. And so you could easily take something like a powerful goblin boss that they fight at like level one or two um, and turn that into a minion or a super minion where they go down mm -hmm. quicker because now the players will feel like they're growing stronger because, hey, I remember when that guy nearly killed us and now I just cut him up in two swings. Um, and yeah. it's more... It's more of that, I think, and also it speeds up combat, but let and also lets the the, the fireballing mage get that ex feeling of, mm -hmm. of of destroying and wrecking half the room, but not actually doing it right. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so something really important, I think, is to realize if you're trying to like even if you're trying to play fifth edition like strictly by the book, the hit points aren't a fixed number. The hit points are a range. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's it's easy to say legally, okay. This particular goblin does not have 10 hit points. This particular one has seven, right? Right. The second hit will get him down. Because, uh, I mean, why not, right? Is you're going to make the player feel cool. It's going to help your combat have the, the more cinematic, exciting feel that you want, right? Like, no one wants to have to take a whole other turn just to wipe off one hit point from the very last little mook, right? Right, right. I have I have kick them in the nuts like if they're gonna if they're pretty much just dead just like I kick them in the nuts sure <laughs> they're, they, they're gonna die because that's one of those things that I think affects the flow of combat too if the damn bastard has three hit points and nobody hits it it is a boring round <laughs> for them oh, at yeah, least yeah. oh I missed I missed I missed this little bastard is just darting around I can't get him can I kick him in the dick sure <laughs> he's dead. Um, cause that's one thing I think happens uh, a little too often is you get in those combat scenarios where you got one guy left, he's got a few hit points and they just can't hit the bastard because of crappy rolls. Oh man. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Ian, did you have anything on this bad boy? Any thoughts? Yes. Sounds like a blast to me. And, um, ah, fireball blast. I see what you did there. Yeah. Or was that a happy accident? It was a happy accident. Oh, like, like me. Get and I just like dynamic, fast, quick. But epic sounding combat, and this fits yeah. the bill. Yeah, so for sure, there you go. Uh, thank you for reminding me. I was like, man, I know I got this from somewhere. Where's the name? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, I think that'll do it for our dungeon master tip, super minions. Our player tip of the podcast is don't, don't be, be a, a dick. dick, and you can don't avoid dick. dick, dude. My <laughs> role playing is choice, um, and what we mean by that is you express who you are through the direct uh, decisions you make. When an, adventurer, uh, when an adventurer gives you a choice, the consequences of your choice shape your adventurer's life. Get into character and let your character's unique concerns, motivations, uh, concerns and motivations guide your decisions so that the result is true to who the character is and who you want that character to become. And there's a huge glaring typo. In that. <laughs> that, that's driving me nuts. Uh, there we go. 
Anyways, um, so don't depend on the adventure to present your character with life-altering choices. Um, instead, help the DM create meaningful decisions for you by clearly and consistently expressing what matters to your character. And take the initiative to set up your choices on your own. If there's something you want to happen in your character's life, tell your dungeon master. Say, hey, my, my character's end goal is to become king. But in order to become king, I got to become a mayor or a nobleman. Can you help me on this journey? Um, you, are, you are in charge of your character's growth by every decision. If you want your character to be heroic, jump in the flaming fire to save somebody. Don't, oh, eh, there's no goal for me. I'm going to go do something else. If you want your character to be a rude, incon uh, inconsiderate prick, well, interrupt people when they're talking, when the NPCs are talking. Say, yeah, I don't care, dude. No, no, I don't got time for this. Where's the booze? You know, <clears throat> do those actions, draw out the character goals you want. You have the power like E-Man. What do you think, Zipperon? You just blew my mind a little bit. Like, this is fantastic advice, right? Like, I, I think that the heart of this is what you're trying to get at here is you should look at the elements that are in your adventure that your DM presented to you. And you should ask yourself, how can I use this as an opportunity to express a character trait? Yes. How can I use this situation to further my character's development? And putting the onerous on you to take some initiative in doing that, that's, that's a really great way of looking at it. Yep. That's how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there with the roll and D&D &D and dice? Yeah, but um, <laughs> this reminds me of how I create a character concept of a commoner who wants to be a knight. Mm -hmm. And he joins the adventure party to hopefully build up enough renown where he'll be recognized. And uh, this character, Racha, will hopefully be, be granted this. Nakuka Racha? Nope, just Racha. Oh. <laughs> so when he becomes a knight, he'll be Sir Racha. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. Oh my Are you gosh. kidding me? No. God. Uh. Just for a twin. Just. And when the, and of course, when the DM said, like, did you create this character concept just to create this punchline? Yes. How long was that time frame between character creation and the punchline achieving, being achieved? Oh, it never happened. I, I'm just saying I came up with this like just so it will happen eventually. <laughs> that would have been a hell of a payoff like a year later in a campaign <laughs> when you get knighted and the DM has to say, I present to you Sir Roger. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you did that on purpose. Oh, yes, man. yes okay, I did. Okay, so remember earlier in the episode I was talking about my 18th level TPK? Yeah. Okay. That's what so causes the, the it. The whole point of the campaign was this object called the loom, right? It was strung with the heartstring of a god and had the power to remake the weave in the universe, right? Oh, that's cool. And so finally, after a year and a half, I finally got there. And I got to say, finally, you see the object that's been looming over this whole campaign. <laughs> <laughs> I am a huge pun person, so I can appreciate all of that. Even the yeah. sriracha. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I had, I had to mention that. I, I love it. I had to just I want to play a character named Mike Hawk. So when you say it, it's Mike Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of shit that I think yeah. of when I'm at work. I once, in a fourth edition game, I built an elven fire monk, and I presented him. He is Bazu, and he hails from the Ka clan. The DM pauses. Did you really just name your character Bazooka? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. So, yes, I did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that'll do it for our player tip of the podcast. Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. And you can avoid dickitude by role playing is choice. I might make the choices that are important that you, to you. I might tow that line here and there. Yeah, you do. <laughs> what, no, not another punchline to follow that? Do I have to bring Kobo? No. <laughs> not puncher? Or is that different? Same guy. All right, so I think that'll do it for our show today. Before we close out, Zipperon, do you want to tell everyone, give yourself a plug, tell everyone where they can find you, follow you, all that jazz? Yeah, please check out my YouTube channel, Zipperon Disney, or just Advanced DM Tips. I just put out a new video on the Rival Party, where I talk about how to effectively create and use rivals. I will be watching that in the next 24 hours, so thank you for that. Yeah. I'm going to have to start it's, sharing uh, your shit. I'm going to put really my show out of business. Doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. That show's going to be gone. <laughs> Why? Well, just go watch Zipper on. 
You don't even need us anymore, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that'll party. He always seems to be one step ahead of you. And once the, you, you think you finally like, got to jump on them. Nope. They already raided the dungeon, stole the treasure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be an awesome encounter idea. And they even let, let, let the sign for you saying, You guys are too slow, suckers. We hate these guys. Sriracha was here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, One of the examples I give in the video is you try to go buy health potions, but they've already bought them all. Oh, I love that. <laughs> what? There are no. Is there health potions here? Well, there's a potions uh, master. Why don't you go talk to him? Oh, actually, the adventure party that just passed through bought them all. Those Cox. Newman. <laughs> um, is there any social there in the store? Is you can't any... fight them. It's like violence. It's no conflict. And what they're doing, and they're technically not doing anything wrong, too, which makes it even worse. Right? Oh, man, they're just being dicks. Like, oh, man, what if they, like, bribe somebody to give you the wrong direction? So the, all the adventurers go to the wrong place, and <laughs> they finally realize they turn around. This map took us to the wrong location. I know. I Oh, I made... I'm sorry. You were supposed to take a left at the floor. I, I apologize. Insight check. Oh, he's full of shit. <laughs> um, do they have any social media that they can follow you on? Uh, I'm on Reddit all the time. I'm on YouTube. I occasionally get on Twitter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on... If you write a comment on my YouTube video, I respond to nearly everything. So. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to test that. Sir Papa that goes. Acquisition Incorporated versus Dran Enterprises. <laughs> <laughs> Make it happen, Captain. All right, well, that'll do it for our show today. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Zipron. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy it. to be here. Hopefully you enjoyed yourself here, if you did. Yeah, and I enjoyed your podcast. I've been listening to it ever since uh, Catacon. Oh. It's on through my playlist along with uh, Faculty and Home Show. Nice. Oh, man, good stuff. Wow, I feel honored to be up there with the... That was a fun convention. Yeah, the Home Show <laughs> and uh, the, the RPG Faculty. Anyway, so... Uh, please join us on our next episode. We'll be discussing health, armor, and endurance in tabletop games with our boys from Inner Party Conflict, Gabe and Jeff. So don't miss out. I also do regret not being on that Friday game. <laughs> what? I was kind of bummed with that in that Friday game. Yeah. Oh, it was awesome too. There was so much fun. Okay. But no, I visited my mom, so I was up for twenty hours by the time I got back. Yeah, you're such a <laughs> bastard having a real life. What the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I work third shift, so if you have any feedback on our tips and <clears throat> if you have any feedback on our tips and tricks or topics you'd like us to discuss, please send them to us. You can email them to us at critacademy at gmail.com or find us on fit Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or our website, all that jazz. Yeah, we hope you've enjoyed your experience here at Crit Academy. If you did, you can help others find the show by leaving a hopefully five star review on iTunes or your platform of choice. Or just send us a message. Tell us how much you enjoy the show. Or be like that one guy. Tell us how much you suck. Dad. <laughs> but don't do that. <laughs> I don't like that guy. I don't know who him is, but who he is, I don't like him. He was a troll. Yeah. Also, be sure to give us a like and a share. Make sure to subscribe to our show at CritAcademy.com. Follow us on Twitch, YouTube, uh, Facebook. We are streaming to Facebook at this very moment, so go. you can watch us there. Um, I think we're streaming to what? YouTube now? And... YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch simultaneously. Any chance we can also toss up on Twitter since we technically have that? You can't stream to Twitter, can you? Can you do that? I don't think so. I would like Maybe. to find out. Maybe post a that. link to uh, somewhere we're streaming. On yeah, Twitter. I'm going to give you yeah. a list of job responsibilities moving forward here soon. So. God! How <laughs> dare you make me uh, have so more work. <laughs> when you subscribe, uh, you get entered to win the fat loot at our website. Um, I also have added a special prize on our website. So when you subscribe, not only do you get entered to win stuff, but there is a list of six of my favorite resources to use that improve my DMing. Uh, that comes with it just by subscribing, so definitely do that. You can also check out our fellowship members there at our website. Uh, huge shout out to uh, Inner Party Conflict. If you haven't listened to Gabe and Jeff, those guys answer your questions like professionals, not like us, because I don't give a shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> also check out uh, Brute Force and Ignorance. Those guys are awesome. Uh, they run an actual play podcast and all from around the world, different places around the world, which is pretty cool. And check out the Kind GM on Twitter. That guy's blog is full of RP, sweet, juicy goodness. All right. I think that'll do it uh, with the cleanup. I am your host, Justin. I am Zipperon. And I'm your co-host, Ian. Thanks for listening. It's italicized, man. That's news. We gotta, oh, he he had one job to do. Thanks for listening. You let me down. 
Would you like me to uh, lower your coffee to the ground when you die? Yes. Like, look down one more time? Yeah, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> I feel good. Uh, oh, I'll tell you something after the show. Uh, anyways, keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. We're going to go ahead and uh, wave to the camera, guys, as we, uh, we transition out. There we go.